to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it's Christmas, as you know, that time of year when gifts are going back and forth all over the place. You're giving gifts, you're receiving gifts, and it's not just this year, but this happens every year. So I think it's safe to say that this has probably happened to all of us before. You're opening a gift, you see what it is, and you don't really want it. What do you do with a gift that's unwanted? You obviously don't tell the person, well, I don't want this. You don't say that to them, but you take it home. You might open it out of its package or whatever it is. You might try to make this work. Well, let's see if I can start to like this thing or, or use this thing well, whatever it is. But often it's the case you just throw it away. Or maybe you've left it in its package with a plan. You're going to wait a while. Find a person who doesn't know the person who gave you this gift, and you re-gift it. We've all thought about it at least, right? It's just a challenge. With an unwanted gift, you don't know what to do. Sometimes, though, has that unwanted gift surprised you as you've tried to make it work, and all of a sudden, you like it. You really do want it. Maybe take the classic example of socks. If we're honest, how many of us are really super excited you opening the gift and, hey, you got me socks. <laughs> but, but then when you're trudging through the snow, it's cold, it's damp, your shoes, your boots, whatever, it, whatever you're wearing, they're getting soaked, and you say, Mom, thank you so much for those socks. I really, really appreciate them now. Now I know that's just a minor example, a, a silly example, but it illustrates a crucial point we, we hear in God's word today. That sometimes it's the unwanted gifts that are the best gifts of all. Because God today has a gift that he gives us, not just today, but every day. It's a gift we desperately need, but so often in our hearts we just don't want it. It's a gift you actually heard about last week in our services, too. It's that important. It's the gift of repentance. The word of God that brings us to sorrow for our sins and brings us to the joy that only Jesus can give in his forgiveness. We see today that truly unwanted gifts can be the best of all. So we're picking up where we left off last week in the gospel reading from Luke chapter 3. We have John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness to the crowds of people who came from Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. We ask ourselves what Jesus once asked those same people later on in life. Jesus asked them, you know, when you went out to see John the Baptist in the desert, what were you thinking you would find? What did you go out to see? What were you expecting to hear? We can say almost certainly that they probably were not expecting to hear what John said to them next. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. John says to these people, you pile of poisonous, slithering snakes. Who wants to hear that? No one does. And certainly not this group of people. From Matthew's Gospel, we hear that the Pharisees, the Sadducees are here. These are the most, some of the most respected people in Jewish society. And later on, Luke tells us you also have tax collectors and, and soldiers, some of the most hated people in their society. So from tax collectors and soldiers to Pharisees and Sadducees, everyone in between, no one wants to be called a, a brood of vipers. But we can imagine the objection that all of the Jews there would have started to say to John, well, oh, wait a minute, John. We may not all be the best people in the world, but at least we have Abraham as our father. And God chose Abraham to bless all nations through Abraham and his descendants. That's us. So doesn't God just have to bless us? Doesn't God have to have his favor on us? It can't really be this bad, John. Well, in essence, John says, really, God has to bless you? 
Just because you're related to Abraham, God has to bless you, even though I know the people you are, people who can talk a good talk, but you don't walk a good walk. Even though you claim to be followers of the one true God, but where's your repentance? Where's your holy fear of the coming wrath of God? Where are your fruits of repentance? Fruits of repentance like kindness and humility and selflessness and patience toward others. Where are they? John didn't see them. See, John's not just talking to the really bad people. John shoots down the, the claim, their claim that, well, if you think you can have Abraham as your fathers, don't begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our fathers. For I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Essentially, John says, God can replace you with rocks if he wants to. John's not just talking to the so-called worst people imaginable. He's talking to everyone in that group. He's not saying one sinner is worse than the others. He's pointing to every sinner, and really not just there, but it's something that all sinners need to take to heart, even as we do here today. That John is speaking to those who think you can have the so-called best of both worlds, that you can love your God and love your sins at the same time. That you can love to praise and worship the Lord with your lips, but then serve yourself and your sinful desires with your life. John is speaking to every sinner because that is what lies at the heart of every sinner. This desire to love, to hate, and to steal, and to curse, and to harm, and to lust, and to disobey, and say, well, it's okay because I love God and he loves me. Do you see this gift? Unwanted though it is from those sinners, from these sinners here today, do you see the gift John gives and how it's the best gift of all, the gift of repentance that is really nothing else, first of all, than a wake-up call that says you are living in a fantasy dream world. If you think you can love God and love your sins, you can't. If you love God, you will hate your sins. And if you love your sins, that means you hate your God. That needs the strongest preaching of God's law, which is exactly what John does next. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. Later on, he tells them, you know, there's one more powerful than I coming, Jesus. And when he comes on that last day, he will do what... We always do at the harvest time. He'll take his winnowing fork, like a pitchfork, throw the wheat into the air so that the wind can blow the chaff, the worthless part of the wheat. It'll blow away. And the good grain will fall down. And Jesus will gather that good wheat into his barn, but he'll take that, that worthless chaff and burn it with an unquenchable fire. He's saying that when Jesus comes at any moment as he promises, he will take every unbelieving, unrepentant heart and every sinner that does not produce the fruits of repentance and he will do all that they're good for. He will burn them forever with the unquenchable fire of hell. But in this gift of repentance, John gives that good news too. What repentance is really all about in the end is leading you to repent of your sins. And to rejoice that Jesus forgives you as you are contrite in heart and sorry for your sins. And come rejoicing in the free forgiveness God gives to you. He promises he will gather us up to live with him for all eternity. This gift of repentance God gives is for sinners. And you notice that's exactly who every one of us here today is. Sinners. You wonder what John might say to us if he were standing before us. Would he look at us and say, you brood of vipers, you vile serpents who don't practice what you preach. We look at ourselves and we wonder, how has our repentance been? After all, you might be wondering, hey, well, we heard about repentance last week. Why are we hearing it again? Well, how has your life of repentance been 
since you heard the encouragement to repent last week. And even if you have repented of your sins, that means you know the struggle within, the sinful nature within you that resists this gift of God and you don't want it by nature. Because your sinful heart says, all that this is, is judgment and punishment. I don't like to hear that because I love my sins. So God gives us this wake-up call to realize repentance means God loves you. And he does not want you to love your sins. They can't coexist. But most of all, as God unwraps this gift of repentance for us, as he shows us his law, what you see in the center at the heart of it all is this gift is nothing else than the pure joy of Jesus. Jesus and his forgiveness, Jesus and his love, that as he has woken you up to see the sins that condemn you to hell, in repentance he wakes you up to see as well that Jesus forgives every one of our ugliest sins. Repentance, that gift, is nothing else than the joy of Jesus given to you at your baptism, where God washes away all of your sins. It's the joy of Jesus that saw you heading straight down the road to hell, and God couldn't have that, so he grabbed you by the shoulders in repentance, turned you around to follow him into heaven. It's the joy of Jesus in repentance that has changed your mind so that now you hate the sins you used to love, and you love the God that your heart used to hate. It's that joy of Jesus that leads us to say with the prophet Zephaniah, Be glad and rejoice with all your heart. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. It's almost unbelievable. God delights in you as you unwrap his gift of repentance and rejoice in him. After all, that's what you do with a gift. You open it, but then what's next? Do you just say, well, this is the best gift ever, so I'm never going to use it. I'm going to hide it away in a corner and never want to think about it again. Never, not at all. With the best gifts of all, you see how they are put to work in your life. And that's what God does with his gift of repentance. It goes to work in your life too. With those people in the crowd, we're excited. We're asking, well, we have this gift of repentance. What does that mean next? What now? The crowd said, well, what should we do then? And John answered, the man with two tunics should share with him who has none, and the one who has food should do the same. Essentially, John was saying, even though he didn't use this cliche, that repentance is the gift that keeps on giving. God has given you the sorrow of your sins that leads to the joy of God's forgiveness of those sins, and that leads to you giving to others. After all, if you have Jesus in your heart by faith, what, what else could you possibly need? In fact, you have more than you need in this life. Because if you have Jesus, you have everything. So as you look at others who don't have much as much as you, they are in need. The joy of Jesus within you says, I have all that I need in Christ. Why won't I give some of what I don't need to someone else? And the list is not limited to just clothing and food, as John says here. But it's at this moment that that snake-like heart of ours that still lives within us says, even hisses at us? Oh, come on. Stop giving. Stop caring. Stop thinking about other people. That's for God to do. Our sinful heart starts to say that if you are going to give to others and produce these fruits of repentance like humility and patience and compassion and kindness toward others, you're going to be the loser when it's all said and done. Because... Your sinful heart can't stand to lose its sins. Your sinful heart does not want Jesus. 
So we praise the Lord for this gift of repentance that wakes us up to see Jesus is all that we need and to warn us that if we resist these fruits of repentance and the gift of repentance itself, we will be nothing else than a dried up dead tree. Good for nothing else than to be cut down and thrown into the fire, as John says. So it's in repentance that we, like any tree, get what we need to be brought back to life. The water of God's word that forgives all our sins. The waters of baptism that cleanse us from every sin because of Christ. It's that water of God and his baptism that brings us back to life so that what was not there is now there. The desire to give to others, produce these fruits of repentance. And you wonder then, well, what will that look like in my life? What are the fruits of repentance? We're, we're inclined to think, well, that means if I'm doing something for God, it's got to be as big as God is. I have to do something impressive and awesome. So we start to say, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll take a mission trip around the world and convert every person I meet. Maybe I'll do something just extraordinary. I'll start an orphanage and help all these children in need. Maybe, maybe I'll just climb a mountain and see what that does for me. Now, those aren't bad things, but you notice that's not what God says you must do to produce these fruits of repentance. Look at the tax collectors and soldiers. John doesn't say to them, stop being a tax collector, stop being a soldier. He says, you can stay where you are, but think about the people you serve. Tax collectors, stop cheating these people. And in doing so, in that fruit of repentance, you'll not only let them have the money that's rightly theirs, you will give to them compassion and kindness and peace. And you soldiers, you don't have to stop being soldiers. It's a good calling. But look at the people you're called to protect. Don't harass them. Don't shake them down and, and falsely accuse them. No, protect them. And in doing, the, in doing so in that fruit of repentance, you'll not only protect their lives, you will give them hope and trust and confidence in their lives. See, God doesn't need us to impress him. But he has told us he needs us to love others as he has loved us. So it's simply a matter of asking, well, who are the people in my life that God has called me to serve? To produce these fruits of repentance, to give to others, whether it's at home or at work or at school, in our society or here in our church. Maybe you're a father or a mother God has given you children. Maybe John would say to us here, hey, be patient with your children. Train them up in the way of the Lord. Or you're a husband or wife. Forgive your, your, your spouse. Love them as Christ has loved and forgiven you. You're a worker. And whatever field of work it is, listen to your employer. Help out your coworkers. Work your hardest to serve the people, the clients, whoever it is you serve. You're a citizen. Don't just think about what's good for you. What will be good for the other citizens in this country? This is one of those fill-in-the-blank moments, right? Where God doesn't demand you must do certain things, but he gives us his word that says, here are the people you are to serve in compassion and kindness and humility, in peace and joy and love. So just do it as God has done for you. It's not complicated. It's so simple in Jesus, our joy, our Savior. It's the gift of repentance that produces these fruits of repentance in you and me. That's a gift to your sinful heart and mind. We don't want it. Because all we see is the, the outer wrapping of the law that condemns us for our sins, that judges us for an eternity to hell. And if you just only see that and refuse repentance and the fruits of repentance in your life, that's all God's gift of repentance will ever be to you. A terrifying gift that condemns you now and forever. 
But if you see God unwrapping this gift, if you just watch and see what's at the center of it all, the promise, the gift of your forgiveness, the joy of Jesus who comes to you and rescues you from yourself and from all evil in this world, then there's nothing left to do than rejoice. So repent now and rejoice always until your Savior comes again to gather you and all believers to himself in everlasting life. Amen. Please stand.